Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. All right. Welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. You guys, this past week has been so exciting. It's been so much fun to watch all of you download the episode and listen. I think as of right now, we have 115 downloads, which is crazy to me. And I feel so honored that I get to be on this journey with you. I've been so appreciative of the people who have messaged me on Instagram Um, or have sent me Facebook messages, or have joined the group, or have been on Reddit. You guys have been all over the place. You've told me what you love. You've told me things that have really meant a lot to you, things that really resonated with you. Uh, A lot of encouragement, a lot of just excitement, and I appreciate that. I feed off of that. So it was wonderful to hear from you. So thank you. Thank you for spending your time with me. Thank you for taking time to just Go that little extra step, too, and tell me how you felt. Um, Again, if you're wanting to follow me at those different places, I'm on Instagram at Emancipated Molly. Uh, You can find me on Facebook. We have a special Facebook group where we actually take these podcasts and we pull them apart and we discuss them. So if you would like some community and you would like to discuss these things even further and be able to share your points of view and the things that really hit you or get more clarification it's the the facebook group is called emancipate yourself and the link will be in the show notes if you are you know wanting to submit ideas for future podcasts if there's something that you really really want to hear please message me on facebook or instagram or you can also follow me on reddit i'm emancipated molly on reddit as well I'm currently working on my website, so we will have a blog up soon that will go that will go along with um, with the podcast. So we've got all kinds of really fun things cooking right now. Also, don't forget this whole next three weeks, we're talking about topics that have to do with my coaching group. It's an identity reclamation group. What does that mean? It means if you're still trying to figure out how do I live life now that I've left high demand religion. How do I figure out what is authentic to me? How do I figure out what I believe? Or how do I move forward without shame and fear? I still have a lot of those tapes stuck in my head that I'm going to hell or that, you know, I worry about my parents being disappointed in me or I feel, you know, I'm worried that I'm a bad person or I'm worried about my kids becoming bad people or my marriage falling apart or all of those things. If you have things that are holding you back or those kinds of fears and shame tapes, Check the show notes as well. I do have a group coaching session. It's my third group of this. And you guys, the first two groups really prepared it for you guys. They gave us all kinds of feedback about what really, really worked and what could be improved. And this third version of Reclaim Your Power is going to be really, really powerful. Um, A lot of people are loving the group coaching. They're loving the ability to have that structure to go through the exercises and the workbook. So it is on Kajabi and you have this workbook that you go through and it's a seven-week program. So it's really structured. It really helps you think deep and get down into your subconscious and really get into your emotions and get into your body and get comfortable with being yourself and shedding all of those things that aren't you, all of those things that are part of your past life that are no longer serving you. The people that have been a part of the program have said it's really helped them uh, root into self-worth, have better relationships with people in their life, feel more confident in their relationships with spouses or significant others, more confident parenting, just more confident listening to their inner knowing and their gut. So 
You guys, if that sounds like something that you would like, please check the show notes for the Reclaim Your Power um, landing page, and it'll tell you how to get involved in that. We do start on the 31st, but enrollment is open now. And if you have further questions, don't hesitate to contact me on Instagram or Facebook, and we can talk back and forth. I answer messages all the time on social media, so that is me that's answering. It's not an assistant. Um, I love really having those conversations and, and getting down and dirty about topics and picking apart things that might be holding you back in your own personal life. So I'm more than happy to do that, whether or not we're working together as a, a coach and a client. All right, today's topic, you guys, is my favorite topic. And it's really what started me on this journey to coaching. And if I'm being really honest, it is what started me on my journey out of my religion as well. So as you guys have heard me say um, on social media, and I can't remember if I said it in the last episode, 11 years ago when I was 30 years old, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. And one of the things I learned as I was going through therapy, and at the same time, my husband was getting his master's degree to be a licensed professional counselor as well, um, and we were reading his textbooks and having lots of discussions, so there was a lot of therapy in my life at the time. One of the things I realized that had led me to this place was I had detached from my emotions. In the culture that I was raised in, both religiously and let's be honest, here in this American culture, there are certain emotions that are not okay for us to feel. Society says this emotion is not okay for you to express. In American society, often women, and I'm going to go ahead and really narrow it down and say white women because I think it's different in the Latina culture. Um, it's different in the black culture, in the indigenous culture, and I can't speak for those cultures. All I can speak to is what I know, and I was raised by a white mother, even though I am part of a mixed-race family um, that is both you know, Mexican and, and white American. And I was raised in a very, very white church. So in the culture I was raised in, anger for women was considered unladylike. It was, and not just for women, also for men too. I did hear talks that talked about, you know, schooling your feelings, bridling your anger, just really, really putting a lid on anger. But especially for women, anger was considered this unladylike emotion and nice women didn't get angry or we at least didn't show our anger. And so because anger was an emotion that was difficult for me to express and one that I actually felt ashamed when I did express I learned how to transform my anger into something more acceptable, into sadness. So if I couldn't detach from it completely, if I could make myself not, you know, if I couldn't make myself not feel it, then if I had to show anger, I would usually cry. I usually looked sad, not angry. I would cry at myself in the mirror. My family used to laugh at me all growing up because when I was angry, I would go to the bathroom and look at myself in the mirror and I would cry. And it was kind of my way of getting that connection and that validation and and I guess witnessing myself. I didn't realize that's what I was doing at the time. Um, but I find that now as an adult, here's a hot tip for you adults out there that are learning to reparent yourselves, looking in the mirror and talking to myself, I, I can hold myself better than I can just sitting and talking to myself like in my car or something looking at myself in the mirror I get to it's easier for me to be empathetic and compassionate with myself and so I do a lot of mirror work so if you're working on self-compassion and empathy try some mirror work look at yourself in the mirror as you explain things to yourself and really look at yourself as a human being look at yourself as a person look at yourself as a man or a woman with a wounded child inside, someone who has been through a lot and developed survival mechanisms to get you to this place, 
and who did a bang up job. They did such a good job because you're here and you're alive and you've survived to this point. And it's because of the survival mechanisms that you developed. And if those survival mechanisms aren't serving you anymore, then you can reparent yourself and allow yourself to drop those survival techniques that are no longer serving you. Okay? So there's these emotions that we're not allowed to feel or that are frowned upon. Like I said, in my culture, it was anger. I know for men sometimes feeling sadness or feeling embarrassment can be something that they feel uncomfortable expressing or feeling fear. In sports, because I grew up playing a lot of sports, I was in a family that played a lot of sports, I would often hear um, fathers or coaches say to the young boys and the young men, things like man up, quit crying, um, you know, don't be, I'm not going to say the word, but, you know, don't have female genitals, right? And it was implied that crying, being sad, being embarrassed, anything that would create tears, fear, anything that would create tears or emotion was not okay for men. And men, I feel like you guys have a harder time of it than women do because women are allowed to be emotional. But men in our society, in American society in particular, but Western society in general, there is this stoicism that we expect of men. And women, we are just as guilty of holding men in that position as men are of holding us in our position. Um, Patriarchy is not working for either of us, okay? So in patriarchy, men are supposed to be stoic. They're supposed to have all the answers. They're never supposed to be overly emotional or scared or sad. They're just supposed to be these rocks. And that's harmful to men. There's an epidemic of suicide amongst middle-aged white men because we don't allow them to feel. We don't allow them to express emotion and be human beings. We're expecting these superhuman gladiators. And sometimes women, we feel threatened when men express emotion. And so we've got to look at that part of us and... Men need to look at the limiting beliefs that say that they're not allowed to feel, okay? So that we both have responsibility there. Men and women, when we talk about um, feminism, it's both of us as well, right? Women have limiting beliefs about what we're allowed to express and what we're allowed to do and what's ladylike. And men sometimes uphold those limiting beliefs that they were also taught in our culture by keeping us in our place or by expecting certain things of us. So if we're all going to get emotionally healthy, we all have to look at ourselves and say, what beliefs do I have that are holding me back? And what beliefs do I have that are holding other people back? And we need to work on those things. All right. So we get in this habit of muting or numbing certain emotions. But what we know from Brene Brown who is, if you don't know who Brene Brown is, in the last 10 years, she's become very, very popular as a shame and vulnerability researcher, which the opposite of that is a bravery and courage researcher because you can't be brave. You can't be courageous. You can't have leadership skills. You can't innovate without vulnerability and without shame resilience. So because we want to live these courageous lives, we have to talk about shame and vulnerability. And one of the things she came up with was we can't selectively numb our emotions. We can't just numb anger. We can't just numb fear. We can't just numb sadness. Because what happens is in order to numb, we have to detach from our body where our emotions happen. Our emotions happen in our body. And in order to numb, we have to detach in some way. Some of us detach through just simple thought processes. A lot of my clients have described it as sort of cutting themselves off right here at the throat from the rest of their body. So they're still, they live up in their head is the way that they describe it. And they never let themselves get down into their body And because that feels scary and that's where all their emotions live and it just feels unsafe there. 
So some people, they they numb through thought processes of I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to stay up in my head. I'm just going to think about this. They'll do stop or thought stopping techniques. So if you start feeling angry, they'll rationalize their way out of it. Oh, I'm not really angry. This is no reason to be angry. I shouldn't be angry. Um, I shouldn't feel this. I should feel this instead. You guys, in religion, so often we're taught thought-stopping techniques that are actually really damaging to our emotional health. Um, I like to call it toxic positivity, and we will do an entire episode on toxic positivity here in the near future. But basically, it's anytime you're feeling a difficult emotion, something that's not quote unquote positive, fear, shame, guilt, sadness, grief, embarrassment, jealousy, any of those things, um, we're taught techniques. We're taught that those things are from Satan. They make us feel bad. So those things are from Satan. And we're taught to hum a hymn, to basically redirect our thoughts to something else so that we're not in the emotion. Or we're taught to say a prayer. Prayer can be a thought-stopping technique. We're taught to do things like, um, oh, get thee hence Satan used to be something that I would say. I would, (laughs) you guys, I'm so embarrassed. Mm. In Mormonism, there's a place in the temple where we make a certain gesture with our hand and uh, it's they basically rebuke Satan. And so I used to do that in private whenever I would have these thoughts and I would tell Satan to get the hints. I was telling quote unquote Satan to go away. But really what I was doing is I was telling myself and brainwashing myself to say, this is not an appropriate emotion. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stuff that and I'm going to move to another emotion. We often also heap shame on those who numb in more visible ways. So people who numb with sex, people who numb with alcohol or with drugs, people who numb with overeating, people who numb with anorexia, people who numb with workaholism, people who numb with all different kinds of things, shopaholism. There's a lot of things that we do watching TV. Um, I mean, the list could go on and on. Basically, anything that you see that people overdo can be used as a numbing technique. But like Brene Brown said, we can't selectively numb emotions. So what happened to me is I started numbing emotion, I want to say I was probably 13 years old. In fact, I'm almost positive I was 13 years old when I started numbing emotion. And what happened was As I began to numb anger in particular, because I felt a lot of anger that year in particular, as I began to numb anger and I got better and better and better at detaching from anger, what was happening is I was getting more and more and more detached from my body, more detached from where the emotions were happening, and I was becoming um, dissociated with my body. What happens is over time, You get so dissociated from your body and so dissociated from the ability to feel, you also mute and numb joy, love, contentment, peace, all of those emotions we want to feel, the emotions that feel really good to experience, we have to be in our body to experience. And so the weird paradox here is in order for us to experience a fullness of joy and peace and love and contentment, we also have to experience a fullness of our anger, sadness, jealousy, guilt, shame. We have to experience those fully and completely as well. There is no easy way to get all the goodies without having to work through the things that are difficult to experience. So the price to pay for joy is working through anger and sadness and grief and loneliness, okay? It sounds heavier than it is. I promise you guys, at first, if you've been stuffing emotions for decades like I had been when I first started learning about this when I was 30, being in your body can feel like a really scary place because... (laughs) Emotions don't go anywhere. They come to give us 
messages. And if we don't sit with them and if we don't process them and if we don't move through that energy, they will sit around and wait until we're ready to hear the message. They will wait for years, for decades, for lifetimes. They don't go anywhere. So the crazy bit is that when we finally decide to get down into our bodies and start to feel through and process emotion, it may feel overwhelming at first because it may be crowded with emotions that we haven't dealt with for our entire lifetime. So what I take my clients through is learning how to dip into our bodies a little at a time, kind of like you would dip your toe in water and to get used to that sensation of being down in your body and having permission to come back up out of it, really putting you in control of knowing I can go in my body and be safe and I can come out whenever it's overwhelming. Like I can go down into my emotional centers and I can go back up into my head when it feels unsafe. And the way we do this, you guys, I have all kinds of little stories to explain what I'm talking about. Last time it was shoes. This time it is a storage shed, okay? We were in the military for years, so we had storage sheds. They were packed to the rafters with our stuff. And whenever we would move, I remember after 10 years of moving and not using our stuff, going into that storage shed for the first time, it was super overwhelming, And that's what it's going to feel like in your body. Boxes and boxes and boxes of emotions, boxes of experiences and things that happen that you haven't unpacked yet. I'm not asking you, no one is asking you to unpack all of those at once. That would be harmful and detrimental to us and exhausting. It would throw us into a depression or a funk. That's not what we want. What we want to do is we want to realize we have enough power to go into the storage shed, choose a box unpack it. It's probably going to be one up towards the front. It's going to be one that we carry, you know, one that's really, really close to us. It's one that our mind touches on occasionally and we come back from. But we're going to go to that box. We're going to open the lid and we're going to start unpacking just that experience or emotion. Okay. And you don't have to even unpack the whole thing. Give yourself a moment to just sit with that emotion, feel through it, and then whenever it starts feeling unsafe or when you feel like you can't take it anymore, you can close the box and you can retreat for a while. And each time you visit again, it gets a little less crowded and a little less scary. And this, you guys, is where I really recommend getting a coach or a therapist Because have you ever seen those hoarder shows? I love watching those. Oh my gosh, you guys. I love watching the hoarder shows because it's just fascinating to me on so many levels, like psychological levels and just entertainment value levels. I love watching the hoarder shows. But have you noticed it's never just the hoarder by themselves that are going through all of their stuff? They always have family members there. They always have some specialist there of some sort that's helping them sort through their stuff. That is what a therapist or a coach can do. They can help you, first of all, not be as afraid of the storage unit. And they can help you go through all of the, you know, all of the boxes of things that you have and decide what am I going to sort through? What am I not going to sort through? When, you know, how how much of this do I have to do today? You get to decide that, but somebody's right there with you, validating you and helping you through the process because it is an emotional process and having that support feels amazing and it helps you get things done faster. Really, therapy and um, coaching support help you get things done that you might not do on your own and they help you get those things done more efficiently and with a better sense of confidence and direction. So if you're feeling like you have a hoarder's house full of emotions inside of your body, first of all, know that you're not alone. There is nothing wrong with you. It is a completely normal byproduct of being raised in a high demand religion, Um, especially if you also were raised in a high demand family or a codependent family where there was a family member that everybody had to serve. 
if that happened, you may have gotten really good at shutting off your needs and your emotions as a way to survive. Okay. So there is nothing wrong with you. You are not broken. Um, There is nothing wrong with the way you survived and the way you got to this point. It is what it is. And from this point forward, if it's not serving you, we get to look through that and decide what to chuck that's no longer helping you on your journey. Okay. For this last bit of this episode, what I really, really want to do is I want to go over the seven main emotions. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of, you know, tiny micro emotions, but these seven groupings, all of the other emotions can kind of fit into these groupings. Um, We're going to talk about happiness. We're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about anger. We're going to talk about sadness. We're going to talk about fear. And then I'm going to combine guilt and shame because we experience those physiologically similarly in our bodies. And we're going to talk about the difference between them because they will feel really similar in your body. Sometimes you might be like, I don't know if I'm feeling guilt and I don't know if I'm feeling shame. And I don't know about you, but just the word shame, when I very first started hearing it, most of us don't want to admit that we're feeling shame. Like we run from that word. So if you find yourself having this like gut reaction of, uh, no, I don't feel shame. I always feel guilt. Let me just let you know that all of us feel shame unless you're a sociopath. Sociopaths don't feel normal emotions. So either you're a normal human that feels shame or you're a sociopath. Like I would go with normal human that feels shame sometimes. And even sociopaths, a lot of the times they get to where they are because they've had to survive, Um, often really abusive situations growing up. But we are, let's talk really quick about these emotions and what these emotions, the messages these emotions tend to bring us, okay? So happiness is an emotion that comes, we're going to start with the good stuff, okay? So happiness is an emotion that comes and it lets us know that we're at peace and content with the way things are going in our lives. So feelings of happiness are a great way to gauge if something is right for you. You're going to feel at peace. You're going to feel content. You're going to feel an expansion in your chest, like a joyful feeling. You're just going to feel good inside. You guys know what happiness feels like, right? Like sit and allow yourself to really ponder What does happiness feel like in my body? Think of a time when you were really, really happy and pay attention to the sensations in your body. What do you feel in your face? What do you feel in your chest, in your arms and hands, or in your legs and feet? Really just assess your whole body, starting at the top and slowly scan all the way down as you experience this happy feeling. This is your physiological response to happiness. And when you feel this in your body, it is a cue to you of, oh, I'm feeling happy. Something that's going on is in alignment with my values, with what I love, with who I am. That's happiness. As we chase after, I say chase after, that sounds so powerless as we reel in things that bring us these sensations of happiness, we're going to establish a life of joy and contentment for ourselves. And it will look different for each of us. So you're going to pay attention. Your body will not lie. Your body, your emotions will tell you what actually brings you happiness and what does not. Okay? All right, so following your pleasure, following what gives you those pleasurable sensations inside of your body is going to create a contented, happy, wonderful life for you, okay? Love. We feel some experience of love whenever we feel connected or we feel like we belong with an individual or group. When we've been heard and valued, we often feel some sort of love, whether it's very platonic love or whether it's more romantic love. There is something intoxicating and irresistible about feeling seen and heard and valued for who you actually are. So parents out there who are listening to this, spouses who are listening to this, you want to build love? 
try to sit with your child or your significant other and really see them, hear them, experience them, and value them. When we do that without trying to change them or judge them or guilt them into being something different, that builds love. Okay, the next one is anger, you guys. And anger can get a really bad rap. Like I said, growing up, I was taught that anger was the devil's emotion. It was, you know, contention is of the devil. So I thought all angry feelings were bad. Like, no, that's not a good thing. I'm under the devil's influence. But anger is actually an alarm bell, you guys. Anger lets us know when we feel violated or disempowered or wronged in some way. Anger basically just says something is not right here. Something needs to change. And the thing about anger is I think many of us are afraid that we're going to explode if we feel anger and we're going to do things that we regret. But here's the curious thing. The more we stuff anger, the more likely it is for us to explode because we're putting it under pressure, right? We're not feeling it. We're not feeling it. We're not feeling it. And then it builds up and boom, we become this like nuclear bomb of anger and rage. Anger is not an action. Anger is an emotion. When we allow ourselves to sit with anger, we get clues about where our boundaries have been crossed or where we're not being treated fairly or things in society we think need to change things that are against our values, we get all of this great information. And anger comes with this energy surge. Have you noticed that? You get this like energy surge. I used to remember um, when I'm angry, I can clean so much. I've got all this, all this angry energy. I can, you know, get things done. I can clean so well. It has to be menial tasks because my mind is completely consumed with getting the information from the anger, but there's a lot of physical energy too. So if you're worried about exploding, do something. Use like do a physical activity to expend that anger energy. Go on a a brisk walk or a run, uh, punch a punching bag, dance it out if you need to, um, have angry sex, Write in a vomit journal. A vomit journal is just where you stream of consciousness, anything that comes into your mind, you write it on the page. You don't worry about grammar. You don't worry about if it makes sense. You just write, 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 write until you feel like you've gotten it all out. That's a vomit journal. Use that energy to help you process. That energy is there to help you really get to the bottom of things. And then at the end, when you've processed through that anger, You're going to have this clear direction still with energy behind it to make changes that will bless your life and other people's lives. Every single social change that has ever happened in our society has been driven by anger, by people saying this is wrong and it needs to change. I cannot remember the quote from Maya Angelou. I wish, I wish I would have written it down, but it just came to mind to me now. I don't remember the quote. I'll look for it and put it in the show notes. But she says, don't be afraid of your anger. Don't, don't shove it down. Use it to change the world. Um, I know I just butchered that. I probably didn't say anything like what she said. But that was the, that was the feeling I got from her quote was, use your anger to change the world. You're angry for a reason. It's because things are unfair. Boundaries have been crossed. Things need to change. Listen to it and move forward. Okay. Sadness. Sadness comes around when we feel loss. And we're all familiar with this feeling. I'm not going to go completely into grief today. Grief is a form of sadness. Grief is a little more complex, and we're going to do a whole episode on that just on its own. But grief is a cocktail of emotions. It's got like a sadness base. You know, have you ever made a complicated cocktail and it's got like one thing that's like the base of the drink, but then there's a whole bunch of other things in it? That's what grief is. Grief is like a sadness cocktail that has a little splash of anger and some splashes of fear and maybe guilt or shame, some splashes of love sometimes. 
splashes of nostalgia and jealousy and embarrassment and humiliation and just all kinds of things. So we will go into grief at some later date, but sadness, sadness just alone is what we experience when we feel loss. And a lot of us don't want to feel sadness. It's a really difficult feeling to wade through, but sadness actually draws us together as humans. Sadness, more than anything else, is the emotion that causes us to seek comfort from one another. It's what causes us to seek comfort from ourselves. And so use your sadness to really drive your connection to yourself and to find compassion and love and empathy for yourself and to allow other people to support you. Sadness is the connecting emotion. It's what reaches inside of someone else. It's that caring instinct that we have for one another that allowed us to evolve as much as we have. When we're in sadness, we naturally crave to reach out and to support and love one another. And it's those things that bring us sadness that also build our empathy and our ability to comfort others who are in sadness when it's their time. Fear happens when we feel unsafe, you guys. So fear has gotten a bad rap in the in the past. Also in religion, that if you're afraid, I mean, there, there are tons of scriptures about be not afraid. When we're afraid, it's because we're outside of our comfort zone. We still have caveman DNA and a caveman brain inside of us. And that DNA and that brain still remember a time when a plant we didn't know or an animal we didn't know could end our lives. And we evolved with those instincts intact for a reason. But changing your belief system is going to create that same fear. Doing something different with your life. Oh, let's not even talk about the first time I went to the grocery store in a tank top. Okay, you guys, as an ex-Mormon, that was, <laughs> I was so afraid, so afraid of showing shoulders. Am I going to die from showing my shoulders? No. But there, I had so much fear that I was making the wrong choice and I was going to go to hell. So when you feel fear, recognize that you feel unsafe and get curious with yourself. Get curious about what you are worried is going to happen and then make a plan to keep yourself safe. Acknowledge, I feel afraid because remember, our, our emotions are messengers. They're there to say, hey, hey, warning, you don't feel safe. And so acknowledge, I see you. I know you're afraid. You're worried this is going to happen. Don't worry. I'm going to keep us safe with this plan. This is my plan to keep us safe. Even if that worst thing happens, even if that thing you're worried about comes to pass, this is my plan to keep us safe or to get us out of that situation should it happen, okay? And fear is there for a reason, you guys. Sometimes fear says things that we need to hear to make sure that our plan is airtight. Sometimes fear says, you know, be careful, you know, this thing might happen that you hadn't really thought about, but when you'll allow yourself to really sit and listen to fear and say, okay, I see you. I see you're worried about this. This is my plan. You're going to actually move forward in a much more secure way. You're going to move forward with your fear in tow as a friend instead of as an enemy. So you're going to say, yes, I hear you. I see these pitfalls that you're worried about, and I will either do my best to avoid those pitfalls or I've got a contingency plan should we hit one of those. So fear is, I love how Elizabeth Gilbert in Big Magic talks about fear. She writes a letter to fear and she was like, look, we're going to go on this new adventure. Fear, you have a seat in the car because I know you're coming anyway, but I want you to know you're not driving the car. You're not navigating. You don't even have control over the radio. And that's the kind of experience we want to have with fear. We want to invite fear along on the journey 
because it's coming anyway if we're getting outside of our comfort zone. The only way not to experience fear is to never get out of your comfort zone. And that is no exciting life to live, right? Growth is what makes our life exciting. And so letting fear know, look, we're going on this journey. It's going to be super duper fun. You can come, hop in the back of the car. You have a seat in the back, but you don't ever get to drive this car. You can tell me what you're worried about, and I'll listen to you. You're a contributing member of this trip, but I'm driving the car. And I'll take into account the potholes you see ahead, but I'm driving the car. You don't get to navigate where we're going because fear would never, ever get out of your comfort zone, right? You would just go in circles in your comfort zone. So fear never gets to navigate, and they don't get to even, like, they don't get to play the radio station either. So because fear loves to give us those those thought tapes, we're actually going to be talking about those next week. So stay tuned for that. For episode three, we're going to be talking about limiting beliefs. Because those are the fear tapes. The fear and shame tapes we have in our head, we have so many of them from our years in high demand religion and just from society in general. Things that we've accepted as truth or that we're afraid of or that we're ashamed of or feel like we should be ashamed of. And we're going to explore all of that next week in an episode on limiting beliefs. So stay tuned. It's going to be super exciting. And then last, guilt and shame. And so... Guilt and shame feel the same in our body. And you guys, what we did with happiness, I want you to do with all of these emotions. Do a head-to-toe scan. Think of a time when you felt that emotion and do a head-to-toe scan to really get clear on what that emotion feels like for you because it is different for each and every one of us. So head-to-toe scan it. And then that way, whenever you're feeling that physical sensation, you'll know, oh my gosh, I think that's right. This feels like what I thought sadness felt like. Sadness is about loss. What am I feeling like I lost? What am I sad about? And get curious with yourself that way. This is especially important with guilt and shame. For me, my head goes down. I just want to disappear from sight. My cheeks get red because I'm embarrassed. My armpits sweat. I feel shaky and a little lightheaded whenever I'm feeling guilt or shame. And they feel the same in my body. Guilt and shame feel the very same in my body. However, guilt and shame are completely different animals. Guilt guides growth. If you have a pen and pencil or a pen and paper, write this down. Guilt guides growth. Shame drives destruction, okay? We want to experience guilt more frequently than we experience shame. And like I said earlier, you guys, all of us experience shame. We're human beings. We experience all the emotions unless we're sociopaths, okay? We're going to experience shame. And we will talk about that in a shame resilience episode here soon. It is too much to cover in this episode. We'd be going for But just to su- suffice it to say, shame is I am bad whereas guilt is I did something bad. Shame blames us and says we're the problem. Guilt says I'm a pretty darn good person who made a mistake. There is a big difference in those messages. When we feel guilt, we are able to change. We have hope and optimism that we can change the outcome. I said something that hurt someone's feelings. I can go and apologize. I'm a good person with good intentions whose impact did not land. I can go and say, I am so sorry that I hurt you. My words were thoughtless. I wasn't thinking about how you would receive that. Or I said that out of anger and I hurt you and I'm sorry. Because guilt doesn't believe you are bad. Guilt just says, hey, your actions were out of alignment with your values. We feel guilt when we act in ways that are against the values we hold. If I were to blatantly lie to someone, knowingly blatantly lie to someone, I would feel guilt because honesty is something I value. If I were to steal something from someone, I would feel guilt because Integrity is something I value. If I were unkind and called someone, 
you know, names. I would feel guilt because making people feel safe is something I value. And it's so wonderful. I mean, I just had an experience yesterday. I was talking to a virtual assistant. I'm hiring a virtual assistant. And we were talking about this podcast. And she was asking me if I had transcripts. And I told her, no, I hadn't done transcripts. And she said, you might want to consider that because there are people who read the transcripts. It really makes it better for people who are hearing impaired to be able to participate in your podcast. I've been doing all of this work on ableism, you guys. And immediately I felt guilt because I want to be inclusive. Being inclusive is one of my values. So I felt guilt and I thanked her. When you're feeling guilt, you're able to realize, oh my gosh, I have these great intentions, but my impact, I'm not impacting people who are hearing impaired. In fact, I'm ostracizing them. That goes against my values. And I thanked her for bringing that to my attention. And we will be having transcripts soon. I'm trying to figure out how we do that. And we will include that as part of the show in the very, very near future. My apologies to those who are hearing impaired who've been trying to participate in this podcast and haven't been able to. I learned something valuable because of the guilt I experienced when someone brought that up and helped me recognize I'm not in my values by not providing a transcript. I had no idea. It had not crossed my mind. I'm so glad that she was able to share her experience as someone who's hearing impaired and help me widen my perspective. Thank heavens for people who are able to share their stories. Thank heavens for 10 years of shame resilience work that I've done so I could hear it without being defensive. Shame, on the other hand, says you're a bad person. And that used to be my go-to. It used to be my go-to whether my husband was telling me, you know, there were 20 pens on the kitchen island. That would happen. He would say, hey, where'd all these pens come from? How come there's 20 pens here? And immediately I wouldn't go to guilt like, oh my gosh, I left all those pens out. I would go to shame. No matter how kindly he said it, no matter how thoughtful and empathic he tried to be with his message because I hadn't done my shame work and the message in my head was still, I'm a bad person anytime I do anything imperfectly, I would go immediately to shame. And you guys, shame is positively um, associated and positively means like the more shame you have, the more of these things you have, the more shame you have, the more likely to experience depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. You guys, it is a big deal for us to work on our shame. A lot of the events we're seeing happening in the world is because we have a lot of work to do as a society on shame resilience. We have used shame to parent children and to keep people in line in organizations of all types for centuries. And people who are steeped in shame have a really hard time changing And they have a really hard time hearing other people's stories because when they hear this is harming me, they hear you're a bad person. And we will all fight for worthiness when we believe it's a choice between that person and us being worthy of love and belonging. So shame is a big topic and we will be delving into it in another another episode. Just know shame and guilt are human emotions that are going to be really big topics in our journey out of religion because shame is a big deal when it comes to high demand religion. And it's often how we were kept in line in our religious experiences. And so if you have any of those, I'm not worthy of love and belonging. I'm a bad person. I'm worried I'm going to hell. God doesn't love me unless I'm perfect or doing everything. You guys, you're you're experiencing shame and I would love to talk with you. Please make sure if that's what you're experiencing that you find your way to my Facebook page or to my Instagram page and like let's have some message back and forth discussions because just speaking shame, shame can't stand being spoken. Shame needs three things to thrive and I'm trying to remember what they are off the top of my head, but silence, so secrecy, silence, and judgment are the three things shame needs to survive according to Brene Brown. And just the act of speaking shame to someone who will hear you with empathy takes away a lot of shame's power. 
being able to express when we feel shame to someone who will hear our story with empathy without adding shame to what we're experiencing, huge, hugely therapeutic. Again, if this is a huge issue for you, this is another one of those places where I highly recommend a therapist or a coach. I cannot express how helpful it is to have somebody that you can express these stories to, have somebody that will hear you and validate your worthiness as you're expressing your deepest, darkest, most shameful experiences and hearing they still see you as a worthy person and help you, more importantly, see yourself as a worthy person because that's how we build self-worth. All right, we've gone through a lot today, you guys. To end this up, I'm just going to talk really quickly about the RAIN method. The RAIN method is something that um, Michelle McDonald developed. She's a mindfulness teacher, and it's a cute little acronym for Recognize, Accept, Investigate, and Non-Identify. It's really helpful when we're feeling emotions to recognize that we're feeling something, right? Something's going on in my body. When you're very first starting, you guys, just recognizing something's going on, whether you know what that emotion is or not. Something's going on. I feel off. Accepting that you feel what you feel. Not what you should feel, but what actually is. What am I actually feeling in this moment? And do that without judgment, you guys. There are no bad feelings. Feelings are neither good nor bad. They just are. They're just information. The I is investigate. Let yourself get curious. Just let yourself get curious about what's going on. What thought caused that? What event caused that? What's making you feel sad or angry or happy or guilty? What's going on there? Get really curious with yourself and keep asking questions until you fully understand. And then N, this is really important, is non-identification. We are not our emotions. We are third-party observers of our emotions. We are recipients of our emotions. We are experiencers of our emotions, but we are not our emotions. I am not anger. I am not happiness, I am not fear, and I'm not shame. I like to think of my emotions as little like little people messengers inside of me. It really helps me keep this third party um, experience going. When I feel sad, I imagine, have you guys seen the movie Inside Out? It's the Pixar movie Inside Out. I love the way they portray emotions in that movie. They've got these little like characters that are each emotion. And that's how I picture emotions in my head. Long before um, Inside Out ever came out, I was picturing anger as this little red dude inside of me coming to give me a message. And it's really helpful to realize the anger will come. The anger can give me a, a message. And I I'm a third party observer. I get to like look at it from all angles, ask it questions, get curious with it. But I never am the anger. The anger is something that has come to talk to me, something that has come to give me a message. And so for me, that's the way I non-identify with my emotions is I picture them as little little characters. Um, they each have colors, just like in Inside Out. So they each have colors, and I picture them as coming to give me a message. And I just, I get a, a chance to ask them questions and get curious with them and look at them from all angles as a way to move through the emotion. Anyway, that has been a lot of information. And I really appreciate you guys sticking with me through this. This is a huge key to healing, is the ability to feel through our emotions. The more you can do this, the healthier emotionally you're going to get. And the more you practice, the more emotionally intelligent you get. The more emotionally intelligent you get, the better you're able to relate to other people and to yourself and extend empathy and compassion. This is a huge key, not only for finding empathy and compassion for ourselves and understanding for ourselves, 
But once we're able to do that, you guys, this is the key to help us begin to extend empathy and compassion and love and understanding to people who are different than us as well. I really believe that those of us who have undergone religious transitions, we have special gifts because of our experiences and those gifts are needed in the world. Those gifts are something that we're here to offer other people and I believe that those gifts will help us bring unity and um, compassion and kindness and equality to the world. I think that what we have to offer as we do our own healing is really important. Thank you again for being here. I have loved every minute of talking about this with you guys, and I look forward to future discussions. I can't wait to talk about limiting beliefs with you in episode three, but as always, please continue to leave me comments, messages on social media, Let me know what you're loving, what you're not loving. Let me know what you want to hear. Let me know what your hopes are. Uh, Connect. I'd love to get to know you personally. And please, if you get a moment, make sure you rate the podcast if it's being helpful for you or leave a review. Every time you do that, especially on the, the bigger podcast carriers, it makes this podcast more visible to other people who might be seeking this help. Thank you again and again and again. And I will see you next week.